Dann gan wird jies und wird verbeend, aber dem sie haben. Und lang de Kap von Peder het recht ob nach de Orkaden. Da liegt im Ozean, wenn ich stipp bis da vergang, ob ich nach diese Land. Hello and welcome everyone. Uh, this is the second ArcSoc talk of the year um, and uh, we're keeping it on the, the maritime theme. And today we, we're fortunate we've got uh, Dr. Bruno Wirtz. Uh, and uh, Bruno was once the youngest diver on the world famous Mary Rose project um, in England. And he introduced uh, scientific maritime archeological research to Southern Africa in 1988. Uh, he's no stranger to ArcSoc He's, he was previously a senior lecturer at the University of Cape Town and is currently the CEO of the African Institute for Marine and Underwater Research, Exploration and Education, as well as a research associate at the Department of Historical and Heritage Studies at the University of Pretoria. In 2010, he was elected a fellow of the Society of Antiqui Antiquaries of London for his services to maritime archaeology and history. And today his talk is all about the Harlem and uh, the, the, the Harlem was a United Dutch East India Company ship and it wrecked in Table Bay on the 25th of March 1647. The events that followed had far reaching consequences and this incident can be regarded as the catalyst that created one of the roots of modern South Africa. Since 1989, a project has been underway to search for Harlem. This presentation provides a brief overview of work undertaken to date. This has resulted in the location of a site that, based on currently available evidence, possibly contains the wreck. And without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to you, um, Bruno, and you can take it away with your talk. Thank you very much indeed, Nick. Um, thank you for your support in this uh, with this medium. And uh, on that note, I would also like to thank everybody else that has been involved in the Harlem Project to date. And uh, those were uh, very supportive uh, companies and people. And I would like to highlight Gurini Marine Construction, who has uh, sponsored most of the uh, archaeological field work and broadband geophysical that uh, undertook extensive geophysical surveys of the supposed site. Then we have uh, a number of volunteers uh, that put in uh, their bid. And I would like to thank the various government departments that were involved for uh, reasoning of permits for giving permission to excavate on the beach. Now, today I would like to talk to you about Haarlem. Haarlem was a Dutch East India Company ship built in the Netherlands and was active on uh, three successful return voyages to the east. Uh, in uh, the mid-1640s, it left for a fourth mission to Batavia, present-day Jakarta in Indonesia. It uh, took in cargoes and sailed back towards the Dutch Republic. And halfway through this voyage, it called in Table Bay, together with two other vessels, and uh, got caught in an adverse wind. The rudder refused to operate for whatever reason is unknown, but uh, the rudder didn't function, and uh, the winds and the currents pushed the ship ashore in the shallows just before uh, the beach. And uh, there it got stuck and stayed. And this story is going to tell you a little bit about the search for this wreck, because as already indicated, it has great meaning, symbolic and historical meaning, to this country, but also overseas. And in fact, there is no nation in the world whose history is so narrowly entwined with a shipwreck as South Africa, South Africa and the Harlem. Because what happened is that after it got stuck, people went ashore, half of the crew was picked up by the accompanying vessels and brought back, but half the crew, 62 people in total, stayed behind for a period of a year to salvage 
as much as was possible. And during this time, they encountered indigenous people as well. And this uh, resulted for the first time in friendly relations between callers and indigenous people. And uh, this ultimately decided, uh, made VUC management decide to establish the Cape, uh, the Cape, the Tavern of the Seas, the refreshment station that played a vital role in the shipping traffic of not only the Dutch East India Company, but all the other nations that passed. Now, before I continue, I need to tell you a little bit more about shipbuilding. Shipbuilding and the area where we assume the wreck of the harbor is situated. And this picture by Thomas Bowler, which is in the William Fair collection in the castle, dates to about the mid uh, 19th century. And it shows a view north of Table Bay, the coast of Table Bay, from uh, about Milnerton upwards. And here you see a number of ship remains, some nearly completely buried, others more on the surface from different dates, different years, to a very recent incident in the background. And this part of the bay, the whole bay itself, uh, saw a number of shipping incidents over the years. Harlem was only the second, but in total, over the years, more than 350 ships found an end on the shores and under the waters of Table Bay. The majority of those occurred during the 19th century. And in the area of interest, we have 12 recorded shipwrecks in total, uh, of which the majority, by far the majority, dates from the 19th century, and only one to the 17th century, and that is the Harlem. Now, one of the problems with searching for a wreck, of course, is that you might stumble on another wreck. And how do you recognize it? Well, in this case, it's very important to know that because we don't uh, want to identify the wrong wreck. And based on this painting, based on uh, knowledge about shipbuilding, uh, this following information is of vital importance. In the 19th century, Ships that were built were built uh, in a different fashion as previous centuries. Whereas Dutch East Indiamen were quite sturdy, heavy vessels, 19th century vessels were made for speed. Time was money. You needed to transport cargoes as fast as possible. And for that reason, those ships were built in a, in a very different fashion. And one of the typical characteristics Characteristics of ships from about the 1790s onwards, uh, sorry, the 1770s onwards, is that their outer hull is cladded with copper, copper or mince metal, uh, which prevents fouling, fouling by marine organisms and attacks by uh, wood bearing uh, organisms like uh, Teredo Navalis, the ships who were. Dutch East Indiamen, on the other hand, were clad with iron nails, thousands of them, and that prevented uh, also fouling, as uh, when uh, while rusting, they, uh, these nails created a protective shell to protect the outer plank. So both types of ships, Dutch East Indiamen and 19th century vessels in general, had cladding, but uh, the cladding different, different, and uh, the uh, the Dutch ones uh, had iron, and the 19th century ones had copper. Nick, may I ask you to switch on the video, please? Uh, we have a video image of uh, a video doc. Uh, two, that was broadcasted by BBC Two, 
uh, 25 years ago of a shipwreck that was found in the area of interest. And uh, that was recorded on the national news. Just to illustrate the type of uh, archaeological find, the type of shipwreck that you might find in that specific area. Yeah. Hoping it's playing. Yeah, that <laughs> I was listening if I could and hear anything. With scientific oddities. I don't know. Uh, if maritime I could archaeologists have unearthed no? a mystery okay. yeah, ship on the shore of Table Bay. The site can hardly be more beautiful for an archaeological dig. <clears throat> a big hole has been excavated on the sweep of White Beach at Bloberg, and researchers have uncovered 15 meters of an old timber hull. Surveyors and marine archaeologists from UCT are cooperating on the project, and a new technique of surveying with video equipment is being used. Maritime archaeologist Dr. Bruno Wirt says shipwrecks are an important clue to past history. Uh, Table Bay has more than 350 recorded historical shipwrecks mm -hmm. and uh, any clue we can uh, obtain to solving the mystery of maritime traffic, commercial expansion and the social aspects related to that to South African society are an interesting and important I think for this nation and also for uh, other nations overseas. Amid all the other wrecks on the coast this one is not identified but Dr. Wirtz believes it's a merchantman which ran aground between 1780 and the turn of the century. The origin of the shipwreck, its name and age, remains a mystery, but marine archaeologists will hopefully come up with the answer soon. Charles Poe at Dolphin Beach for Cape at Six. And that concludes the news bulletin. Great. Please continue, Bruno. Thank you, Nick, for that. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I already indicated to you that uh, we're looking for a specific type of ship, a Dutch East Indiaman, and uh, that those type of ships differed very much from later period vessels. And here is a, a real life example of the wreck of a Dutch East Indiaman. It dates uh, a century after Haarlem, but in design, it is very, very similar to our ship of interest. This is the Amsterdam that sank on the coast of Hastings, the southern part of England, in quicksand and that's why it's so well preserved. And here you see the bow, the front part of the vessel, the stern, the back part, starboard, the right hand side, and port, the left hand side. And just to get an idea of scale, compare the, the vessel, the wreck, to the people standing around. This ship measures 45 meters in length and about 10 meters across. And those are also the dimensions of Haarlem. The ship is built uh, in a different fashion from 19th century ones. Uh, the material are often different. Uh, Dutch ships were built of oak mainly. And uh, yeah, all in all, uh, it was uh, designed to carry as much cargo as possible and not to be a fast sailor. So, contrary to the 19th century, uh, time was of less essence. And uh, ships like this could take up to, uh, between six and nine months to reach either Batavia in the east or the home. In January 1635, the regional office of Amsterdam, the VUC was divided into six different offices, but the Amsterdam office instructed to build a new East Indian. The sizes, the dimensions were indicated and, uh, as I said, identical to what you just saw. A length of about 45 meters, a width of 10 meters. So quite a distinguishing feature. The name Harlem has often been corrupted. And this is a mention in the historical documentation in the Dutch State Archive, where the first time the ship is mentioned as New Harlem. 
in modern day Dutch, uh, the U would be followed by a W, New Harlem. Uh, but this is the original and the first time the name appeared in the paper. Later, uh, and, and during in, uh, other documentation, just Harlem is mentioned. And Harlem is the name of a town 15 kilometers to the west of Amsterdam. As I already mentioned, once the ship was completed, it was sent off on uh, different mis missions. It made three successful return voyages and it found it on the way back home from during the fourth voyage, on the 25th of March, 1647. Now, hundreds of Dutch East Indiamen were built over the years, and uh, many of those didn't leave man many traces except for documentary evidence. In the case of the Haarlem, I got extremely lucky by also finding a depiction and a depiction of the incident itself. And this painting is the owner, uh, under the ownership of an art dealer in New York who uh, kindly made this copy of his painting available. And what does it show here? It shows a view from the northeast coast of Table Bay that is recorded also in the historical evidence as the place, the approximate place to find it. During uh, the research, I came across a diary, a diary of Leendert Jans, the junior merchant on board the ship, and he meticulously recorded all kinds of details on a day-to-day -day basis. And amongst other things, he indicated the ship uh, touched the shallows uh, very close to the northeastern corner of Table Bay. Now, when you stand at that approximate location and you look across the bay, you see Table Mountain. <laughs> and this is a depiction of Table Mountain by an artist who never saw the actual mountain. A, uh, operated from a studio in the Southern Netherlands and based the painting on written reports or uh, direct accounts from eyewitness. And uh, another interesting inaccuracy are these palm trees, which were added by the artist to give it some, some flavor. But uh, as you all know, at the time there were no palm trees on the shores of the Bay. What is more accurate is a group, a small group of people, indigenous people, who uh, witnessed the incident. And uh, indeed, the records indicate that shortly after coming ashore, the people from Harlem were visited by a group of indigenous. And uh, that first contact must have been quite nervous on both sides. And uh, yeah. Uh, what was exchanged was some tobacco and uh, against some crepe, some bread and tobacco. Now, this picture can be dated, well, it indicates uh, a specific event. What we see here is the ship Harlem stuck in the shell. This is one of the accompanying vessels. The Harlem was accompanied by two. And these rendered assistance. And what you see here are some ship's boats, smaller boats, that are bringing people and goods to the shore. Here in the background is another ship boat that was cast to shore. And this is recorded by Leendert Jans, uh, two days after uh, the ship got stuck. Uh, but the, the ship's boat was uh, swamped. And the people inside were thrown out of it. A carpenter who couldn't swim drowned and was buried ashore. And uh, the ship's boat was repaired later on and uh, made operational again. So this painting uh, can be accurately dated. And uh, it's just uh, quite a coincidence that I came across this. 
what do the painting and the historical documentation tell us? First of all, that the, the wreck found it in shallow water at a distance of no more than a musket shot from the beach, and that translates as under 60 meters. The goods and people were transferred with smaller boats and rafts, and uh, the ship could not be salvaged. There was a report that uh, they tried to, but uh, according to Leonard Jans, this was as possible as counting the stars. So the, the Harlem was there to stay, and uh, after the incident, uh, some of the people also stayed on board for a number of weeks after the foundering. And here again, a enlargement of the situation whereby you see people on the shore um, busy with uh, personal items like in these chests and other goods that were obviously lying around and that could be uh, salvaged very quickly. And here you see a few people trying to repair the ship's boat that was past the shore. Now, what did these people do when they reached safety? A week after the Hanum got stuck, they started building a survival camp, and they appropriately called it Fort Sandenburg because it was built in the dunes, in the sand dunes. They also dug a well to ensure drinking water. And this is a very important aspect of my talk, but please remember it. What they did is while digging, somebody recorded the sequential building up of layers of earth. And this was later even published in the Netherlands in a book in 1652. And this is the first stratigraphic column in South African history. And this provided a very important clue, which we will explain later. Another interesting fact is that it is exactly recorded what was left behind in the hulk of Haarlem. 19 iron cannon and four anchors. And this was part of a, a cargo, not an official trading cargo or cargo of trading goods, but these items were brought back and they originated from ships that were laid up in Batavia because they couldn't serve their purpose any longer, and uh, everything which could be reused, recycled, was taken off and brought back to the Netherlands. So these cannon and four anchors were stowed deep down in the hull of the vessel. And finding those, that would provide conclusive evidence that the wreck of the Harlem has been located. Now, other Types of evidence were also very important. And uh, in search of that, I went to the National Archives in The Hague. And they've got, besides all the documents that are of relevance, also maps and charts. And this is a chart of Table Bay. It was originally orientated westwards, but I tilted it for your view. So we've got north. We've got Robben Island, we've got Signal Hill here, we've got a silhouette of Table Mountain, and we've got a coastal profile here, a profile of the Hottentots Mountains and the Tigerberg Mountains. Here is Van Riebeek's Fort, which is currently partly buried under the uh, Golden Acre shopping center. And this is the old roadstead in front of which the ship came to anchor. And this line indicates the safe anchoring grounds, as do the anchors. There are safe anchoring grounds in front of uh, what used to be the Rebex Ford, and uh, nowadays the CBD, and also to the east of Robben Island. What makes this chart very interesting is when you follow this line. The line drawn from Van Riebeek's Ford, straight across Table Bay, 
to the northeastern shore, where Leendert Jans indicated that the incident with the Haarlem occurred. And at this point, you see some scribble. And when I enlarge that, it states in Old Dutch, here on Trent is het schip Haarlem gebleven. And that translates as a, the approximately this location, the ship Haarlem stayed. So besides the, uh, the historical document that mentions the approximate area of foundering, I uh, also now had a map indicating that approximate position. But there was more. <clears throat> Leonard Johnson's diary also indicates a distance from the roadstead to where the wrecking occurred. And he uh, describes that as one and a half Dutch miles. Now, what a lot of people didn't realize in the past is that the Dutch mile is very different from a standard nautical mile or a British land mile. Uh, a nautical mile is approximately 1.6 kilometers. A Dutch mile is, and I give you an exact figure, 7 kilometers and 408 meters. So a distance of one and a half Dutch miles translates into a distance of 11 kilometers and 112 meters. And this distance from Veribik's Fort, from the roadstead, across the bay, ends up here at this location. Now, I'm sure that most of you are familiar with the current situation, the current local situation. When you drive from Milnerton towards Stable View, you use this coastal road. And uh, in just before this bend, you see the northern part of the current day Rietvlei, a lake, a big lake. Then you see a tall building, or a big building, with a uh, brownish, reddish roof and a funnily shaped pyramid type of shape at the northern end. And this is the Dolphin Beach Hotel. So we have now a location, an approximate location, just to the south of the Dolphin Beach Hotel and on the northern perimeter of the Rietvlei. Another map, also from the Dutch State Archives, shows some other features. Here again we have Riebeck's Fort, and this is Signal Hill. We've got uh, the mouth of the Old Salt River there, and when we go to the north, to the northeastern part of the coast of Table Bay, we see a little blob here in the sea. Just there. And this is marked in the legenda to this map as the wreck of Haarlem. So very close, but still in the sea. And across this, there is another feature. And this was indicated in the legenda as salt pans. So we've got a situation in line with the Ribbeck's food, a shipwreck, and salt pans. And these salt pans are mentioned amongst others in Van Ribbeck's diary. He describes la large salt pans above the wreck of Haarlem. And these are also described in Jodokus Hondius Klaar Beschrijving van Cabo de Bonne. Esperanza uh, from uh, 1652. And this is the publication that also records the stratigraphy of the well that was dug by the Haarlem survivors. Now going back to the salt pans, uh, the, this map that dates uh, 100 years after the previous map that I showed you. So this is from about the 1750s. Uh, this map, a much better, much more accurate depiction of Table Bay, as you can see. 
has also a feature here which is indicated as salt beds. Now we know from the previous map that the wreck of Haarlem should have been about here. And also the description of the length from the roadstead to the northeastern part of Table Bay ends up somewhere there. So what we did is to make an overlay based on a current chart of Table Bay and overlay with the map that I just showed you. And there we see the area of the salt pans, the northern part, the southern part, just north of Milton. Now, why is this important? Why do I discuss these salt pans in such detail? Well, in the 1970s, it was decided to extend Cape Town Harbour. And to that purpose, filling material was needed in the form of sand, filling material to backfill certain areas of the new harbour territory. And uh, in order to work as cost effectively, uh, efforts were made to find enough sand in the vicinity. And this brought people to the old salt pans. And here you see the left hand corner of the old salt pans and the northern perimeter that I just showed you. And in this area, they started digging or drilling test holes test holes to see if there is sufficient sand in the area to be excavated and used as filling material. And this was done meticulously of each drill hole. A, uh, a sample was taken and the stratigraphy located. So what you get is unique uh, sites. Uh, stratigraphy, of course, is typical for a specific location, and you can compare it with a kind of fingerprint. So if you find a certain stratigraphy uh, in one point, you can compare it to uh, other stratigraphies. And that is exactly what we did. A student at the Wits University uh, in the Department of Geology was asked to uh, have a look at this, and she took it on as a, as a project and as a thesis. And uh, what she did is this information that I provided that I find in Cape Town archives uh, relating to the stratigraphy, because the stratigraphy of each test hole was meticulously recorded. This asked her to compare to the stratigraphy as recorded by the Haarlem survivors. And she did so. And she came up with a very important conclusion. And that is that the stratigraphy that was recorded by the South African Railways and Harbors at one point coincided for the better part with the stratigraphy as recorded by the Haarlem shipwreck survivors. And this point 11, M11, was in the northwestern extreme perimeter of the area that was covered by the test holes. The test holes were uh, taken all over this place. And the outcome of the 1970s um, study was that there was sufficient sand on the old salt pans to be excavated. And because that happened, we uh, and now have, instead of salt pans, the reed flay in this area. Coming back to evidence in the quest for finding the location of Haarlem, I already mentioned historical documentation and cartographical documentation. And now, we had geological information. So to recoup things, this was the distance as stated, and the endpoint where the wreck is supposed to be. On the northern boundary of the current day lead flow. 
And we have the same here. We have the stratigraphy that coincides most with the Harlem well on the line that borders the northern parameter of the wheat flay and immediately south of the Dolphin Beach Hotel. Well, at that time, we were virtually exhausted from uh, our, our source material was exhausted. Uh, we already recovered the historical documentation, uh, the geological information, and that was, by the way, due to Dr. Sherrod Master of the Department of Geology at Wits University. Uh, we called in the assistance of another good friend, Billy Steenkamp. And Billy Steenkamp is a geophysicist and he volunteered for the project because, like the other volunteers, he thinks the Harlem project is a very interesting one. And Billy, uh, over a number of days, covered the northern coastline of Table Bay with a magnetometer. The magnetometer is a kind of metal detector that responds on disturbances of the earth magnetic field caused by ferrous metals. And uh, this we thought would be excellent to use in the search for it. And during his uh, exploits, during his, uh, his survey, Billy found different sites. And uh, this is just an example of such a site, how it can look like uh, with different signatures, uh, very low key signatures, none too uh, quite uh, extreme, quite high uh, values that indicate the uh, presence of substantial amounts of iron or ferrous uh, uh, objects uh, underneath. In this quest, Billy uh, located five uh, sites that he thought would be worth of investigating through it. And uh, we did that with the uh, assistance of Robert Bauer of Greeny Marine, who uh, was instrumental in the test excavations. And uh, here is a picture of uh, personnel from Marini, uh, from Greeny Marine, uh, with a beautiful table mountain on the background, digging at one of the locations that were indicated by Billy Steenkamp. And on these five locations, we didn't find the hub. We found an old uh, sewerage pipe. We found uh, an engine block of a marine engine. We found poles and scaffolding that had been used while digging up sand in what is now the reed flay. And uh, one uh, block uh, of iron that further didn't have any characteristics that could identify it. And uh, we found a 19th century shipwreck, which of course could be easily identified because it didn't have iron hull cladding, it had copper cladding. But reassessing the survey data, the data that were acquired by Billy, uh, we came across another site, a site of secondary importance at the time because uh, only the signatures that uh, were gained from there were less uh, less intense than the signatures gained on the other five locations. But uh, upon reassessment, upon doing another yet another survey, uh, Billy also came to the conclusion like, hey, this is a very interesting site, a very important site. So we decided to do that one as the very last attempt. And uh, lo and behold, seven meters under the beach, this object appeared. It's hand forged iron, heavily corroded, and uh, quite substantial. Now, this reminded me of something I read in the literature. And I'll show you what it says. 
The commander of the returning fleet that uh, picked up the Harlem survivors a year after the incident, he reported that uh, he saw the wreck, he was there, he left behind, or they left behind the 19 iron anchors, sorry, the 19 iron cannons and four heavy anchors. But what is in this context more important is that the bowsprit, the main, and the foremast were burned slightly and were cast on the beach. Now you must imagine that uh, these spars, uh, the bowsprit, the masts, they had to support the running rigging of the ship, and that is all the rope, all the rope work, the sails, and the blocks and the tack. And in order to fasten those on these masts, uh, clamps were used. And my reading at the time, and this still uh, hopefully can be confirmed at some stage, is that uh, what we were looking at, the uh, iron piece, that that is a clamp of one of these structures. And also Jan van Riebeek mentions this, that uh, there were spars and uh, other aspects of the rigging that were cast on shore. At that same location, but slightly deeper into the sea, uh, we found, sorry, uh, the, the, the clamp was found underneath the beach, so on, on the dry, uh, above the high water mark, so it could have easily been cast there while floating. The nail, this is a copper nail, used to uh, fasten plating, was found in, in uh, shallow wood and uh, together with a concentration of similar items. This nail was used uh, to fasten plates, copper plates, that were used on board ship in the provision rooms uh, for water tightness, uh, for waterproofing, and uh, also in the powder room to prevent uh, sparks uh, that could ignite the gunpowder. We also found iron hand forged parts of the structure, bolts that were used to fasten different parts of the structure. Uh, 19th century ships most of the time would have brass uh, items like this. So this is another interesting uh, object, type of object that we found. This one, quite big, as you can see, was caught in the arm of the mechanical excavator that we used to uh, excavate these test holes. And um, when we were digging at the site, uh, suddenly when uh, the, the excavator tried to pull up the arm of the machine, uh, the whole beach started moving. And finally a loud bang, and that is when this nail broke off. This nail must have been uh, connected to a substantial piece of structure, otherwise uh, the beach wouldn't have been lifted up. But uh, <clears throat> there was too, too much sand above it, a, a few meters of sand at least, to uh, be able to dig there. And I also didn't want to disturb the sand further, so, so we left it, but uh, this was also a very important piece of evidence, the hand for each nail. Then we found dozens of patches of lead, and uh, this was very common on board uh, many VOC ships, on board every VOC ship. This was a general uh, patch used to waterproof things, used to cover the muzzles of, of cannon to make them more to die, to uh, prevent uh, leaks. But this is a very interesting and identifiable object. It's a copper plate with a lead, uh, lead lining at the back. And these plates are mentioned specifically in treatises on, on ship construction. And we have practical examples, for example, from Australia, where 
uh, other Dutch shipwrecks ended up, and uh, one of them uh, was recovered and is put in the museum and has exactly the same type of sheeting. And this was sheeting contrary to the majority of the hull, which was cladded with thousands of iron nails, as I already explained. The rudder section was cladded with plates of this kind that were fastened with copper tacks or copper nails, as I already showed you. And this, of course, was to allow the rudder from uh, moving, because if you would have uh, covered this with iron nails, that would create rust and uh, obstruct uh, the free operation of the rudder. So, very important clue, also an indicator of the approximate position of the wreck, the stern or the back section where the rudder was suspended. Now, to reiterate some aspects of this last excavation, it was the sixth in a series of six, and uh, we only decided to excavate here when reassessing the survey data. And during the second run that Billy made over this site, uh, a lot more came to light because the tide was even lower. We went in deeper, uh, uh, up to waist deep into the water, and uh, this paid off because suddenly all kinds of strong signals started appearing in this vicinity. Now, to give you an idea of scale, uh, this distance is about 150 meters. And the distance between here and there is about 70 meters. Now, at this location, the iron clamp was found, the clamp of which I assume that it could well have been attached to one of the spars that broke off from Haarlem and that floated and were cast on the beach. In these sections, we found copper nails and lead sheeting. And the same here, lead sheeting, copper nails all over the place, but also the big copper plate, the lead line copper plate, and that indicates that it was attached to the rudder. Now, bear in mind what I told you about the length of Haarlem, 45 meters long, compared to the scale, and you superimpose that over this area, then uh, I should say that is an interesting observation. So a shipwreck the size of Harlem could well fit into this. Now combined with the strong magnetic uh, responses, those could possibly indicate the anchors and the cannon that were left behind in the hub. But the final and to date most interesting piece of evidence, if I may call it, is this. This is a copper bangle made from hand-drawn copper wire that can be seen from these impurities. And the ends are bent, they hook into each other, and when you do that, then uh, this uh, dimension is uh, it could fit over somebody's neck. So we're looking at a necklace and uh, a very primitive one, but still what I think could well be a necklace. And uh, there are references, plenty of references to this. The junior merchant of the Haarlem, Leendert Jans, who recorded so much interesting information, also records the first encounter with local people that uh, they communicated and that they bought it. 
And what did they buy? The four pieces of coffee. Also, Verriebeck uh, mentions numerous times this practice that they uh, obtained copper from the Dutch, that uh, they made into bracelets and chains for ornaments. And also, when discussing this with his interpreter, Harry, then uh, he refused, or oh, Harry refused to the fact that the indigenous people uh, chain, uh, made br bracelets and chains from the copper. Uh, iconographic evidence also indicates this practice. Here you see a man wearing necklaces besides earrings. His wife, the same. So, common practice and something required and in, in demand by the local people. Now, to wrap everything up. Based on uh, historical cartographic evidence, on geological information, geophysical information, the results of the test excavations, and the finding of artifacts, it seems that the most likely location of the wreck of Haarlem is here. The Dolphin Beach Hotel, just to the south of the Dolphin Beach Hotel. And uh, yeah, I can just hope that we can uh, continue with a survey. Uh, part of this still needs to be done. And uh, I hope we get permission for another test excavation because I would like to uh, continue with this work and find some more evidence of uh, the possibility that uh, this is the wreck of our and uh, yeah, what happens after that, we'll have to see. But uh, so far, so good. A wonderful project, a ship, a search for a ship that uh, had a tremendous impact on the history of this country and of the Netherlands. Uh, a ship that played uh, a role like no other in the world, in a nation's complete past and uh, for that reason for it uh, not only for its scientific value but also for its uh, symbolic value i hope uh, that uh, there is a way to continue with this project thank you very much ah uh, thank you bruno that was a really wonderful talk and that uh, yeah that uh, went very smoothly uh, for the for the viewers uh, who are watching this uh, later on, uh, you know, we've had a few trial runs through this, uh, trying to get the different video and audio uh, pieces that we've put together for this uh, particular talk through to work quite nicely. Um, and so I think the result, the end result has been worth the, worth the effort. Um, yes, that was such a fascinating talk and it really pulled a lot of different threads together from the, you know, from the stratigraphy to the, you know, the, the GIS and mapping all those different pieces that you've got there over the spread of, of the, the wreck. So you've certainly, if not the Harlem, what, <laughs> you know, so uh, it's Thank almost you. certainly must be, uh, must be the Harlem. Um, so, uh, you know, you covered a lot of the, a lot of the things in your talk um, and, uh, you know, about the cannons and the hold and, and so on. Uh, so I had a couple of questions that uh, you know we've chatted about earlier. Maybe I could just run through some of them again. Um, I, could you elaborate a little bit about uh, you know so those cannons were just in the hold and they were being transported back uh, from uh, Batavia back to to Holland. So they were sort of being repurposed as such. Can you ch chat a little bit about the 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 ones that were on the ship uh, as defence um, and. Uh, what happened to them, and then what? How would you des describe the how, how good was the Dutch uh, building around defences of their ships? Uh, you know, were they very effective? The, the the guns and the cannons that they used at the time. Yes, Nick. <clears throat> Dutch East Indiamen were built specifically for for trade, for transporting merchandise, but uh, they also played uh, 
a role as military platforms. Uh, about one third of the of the people on board uh, were soldiers that were tasked to uh, uh, occupy garrisons in the east, in the trading posts in the east, uh, later at the Cape as well, but also to defend the ships. And uh, the ships had defense themselves in, in the way of cannon, ship's cannon. And uh, a, a ship the size of Haarlem could have had anything between 20 and 30, 35 cannon. Uh, mm. On average, uh, they uh, were manned by expert gunners. And uh, they could shoot uh, quite a, you know, a deadly uh, uh, force. So uh, of the, the encounters that have been recorded between VOC ships and uh, enemy traders or pirates, uh, there, are, there are not many mentioned. In, in general, uh, people try to avoid the, the VOC fleet. And that was another point of strength. Um, ships never sailed alone, unless there was a, an extremely good reason for it. But uh, in most cases, they stayed together uh, as best as possible in the form of escadrons and, and small fleets. So uh, that in itself is also important as part of the defense. The cannon from the Highland were all brought ashore, with the exception, of course, to the other ones that I referred to that were brought back to be reused, to be recycled. But uh, the operational guns on board the ship were brought ashore to uh, fortify the, uh, the little encampment that they had. And uh, when the crew of the Harlem was saved a year later, uh, with the return fleet from 1680, that consisted of 12 ships, uh, the guns were loaded on board together with everything else and brought back to the Netherlands. So that is what happened to the guns from the Harlem. Hmm. Thanks for that, Bruno. Um, and can you tell us a bit more about what the, the Harlem was carrying? Um, and I thought that was quite interesting. Yes, uh, a full uh, list of full inventory of the cargo hasn't been found. Uh, what uh, the information I have is based on uh, the reports from Linda Johns uh, and that refers specifically to the salvaged goods. And that includes indigo, which is a blue dye uh, used in the textile industry in the Netherlands. Pepper, in huge demand in Europe. Pepper of uh, different kinds and in substantial quantities. Cinnamon. Uh, another spice, of course, but also oriental textiles and porcelain. And most of the porcelain was damaged. It was carried in, in crates. Uh, most of those got damaged, but they even transported back the broken porcelain to account for the loss at the VOC offices so that they wouldn't be uh, under the suspicion of uh, com uh, commencing private trade. So basically everything that the people from the Harlem salvaged, everything that was brought ashore, was in the end brought back to the Dutch Republic. And uh, the only things that were left behind were parts of the rigging of the ship, parts of the hull, uh, that were, of course, in, in some cases, uh, reused by indigenous people uh, as firewood. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, it's uh, it's hard to imagine just how valuable, you know, the spice trade was. You know, and how you know the, what what we what we regard as valuable today. You know, and spices are so freely available. You know, today. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I was reading about the the VOC was the the richest ever company in existence, and it's it's uh, worth more than the GDP of Japan and J Germany put together today. And you know, I think. Uh, to have a list of, you know, eight or something like that of the 20 biggest companies like Microsoft, Apple, Berkshire Hathaway, oil companies, etc. You put them all together and you still wouldn't get the size of the, the VOC at the time, which is re really remarkable. Um, and really further adds to the significance of this um, 
this 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 wreck and 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 the sort of moment in history for South Africa, but uh, also just how you know this is very much the centre of the kind of in terms of trade and commerce the universe at the time. Um, the uh, this is these were the, these guys were serious. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, so what would, I mean, one of the other things I was wondering, what, what would have happened to them? You know, the porcelain, that's such an interesting detail. You know, if they didn't account for all the porcelain, what, you know, what would have happened to those guys on the, on, when they got back to Holland? You know, what kind of, would they be punished or uh, what, have you kind of got any idea what might have happened to them? Uh, depending on, on the seriousness, uh, seriousness of the offence, uh, uh, talking about the number of items or the value that was uh, smuggled or, or taken, uh, a fine, uh, so they wouldn't get a salary for a couple of months, uh, or being locked up, or being flogged, or being dismissed from the company service. And that happened to Jan van Riebeek. When uh, the people from the Haarlem were saved, the return fleet that saved them, consisting of 12 ships already mentioned, um, on board was Jan van Riebeek uh, on his way back to the Netherlands because he was ordered to by the uh, directors of the company to account for his involvement in private trade. And uh, when once back in the Netherlands, he was dismissed from the company service and he was unemployed for a couple of years before groveling his way back into the service of the company. Hmm. Yeah, gee, um, yeah, different times, that's a certain... <laughs> um, well, corruption, is, corruption is quite rough nowadays yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah definitely, yeah, times, I think some things never change. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so Bruno, I think you've got a couple of extra uh, resources that I think uh, the viewers would, would be interested in. Um, one was a, a book, I think, and a, a pamphlet. Um, you maybe, yeah, let's have a look at those. And I'll reference these in the description of the video later on. Um, it's, the, the title of that one is the? The Harlem Shipwreck, The Origins of Cape Town. And it was published by UNISA Press, University of South Africa Press. Excellent. And then the, uh, the pamphlet? Uh, the pamphlet is just the pamphlet uh, advertising the book. Oh, okay, great. Okay. So I will, I will put that, I'll put that on the, uh, the information. So for, for those of you interested, I'll also reference the, um, the, the audio clip. Um, I did, uh, that was my last question. Do you know what the song means, or what were the? I don't understand what they were singing about, but it's it sounded, uh, you know, like a very uh, spirited song, mariner's song. Yes, it's a shanty, a, a Dutch shanty uh, about uh, sailing to Iceland. Uh, the Dutch uh, sailed all over the world uh, to Iceland to, to catch herring. And uh, this was uh, part of the repertoire of the 17th century. And, it is, and this is why I put in this specific uh, choir. Uh, this is a German choir trying to sing in Dutch. And this is what it must have uh, sounded like on board Dutch East Indian. Because I already told you that one third of the people that sailed with were military personnel and uh, of those uh, two thirds on general uh, in general were German, mm. so uh, it was quite an international community on board. You had uh, a lot of German soldiers, you had uh, seafarers from other countries as well, Scandinavia, sometimes Scotland. Uh, so they all had to uh, to speak Dutch, uh, which they had to learn on the job. But uh, it must have uh, sounded something like uh, these guys singing. Mm, mm. Yeah, that was a great clip to start with. Yeah, uh, no, fantastic. Um, I really, uh, that was a really interesting talk, and uh, I hope everyone enjoys it uh, when they view this a bit later, uh, and we'll get the notifications out. Um, 
yeah, and just thank you so much again for your time and putting all the energy into preparing this talk and for delivering it. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, our live session last night didn't uh, pan out because the streaming service had uh, some problems which they managed to resolve. Um, so uh, without further ado, I think that was, uh, it was a great talk and I think we're right on time. And uh, I just wanted to thank you very much for that. Thank you, Nick, for your